as those of you who've seen the notice of meeting, this is a very unusual event. It's an unusual event because um, it's a virtual dinner rather than a real dinner. So we're all in the comfort of our in comfort of our homes at the same time and have not got the kind of uh, uh, communication that we normally have on such occasions and the communication between ages and between various types of uh, doctors that participation in, in the association's activities. It's unusual because um, last year the dinner had to be cancelled and uh, this is Simon Baron Cohn was um, very good, kindly agreed to do this a year late and to do this in this in this in this form. The dinner was cancelled because of course of course of events COVID-19. And the 23rd of March is going to be an occasion that's going to be uh, commemorated in calendars in the UK uh, for the probably for the long future. Um, uh, at the request of some members, therefore, we're going to start by having, instead of toasts or anything like we normally have, we're just going to have a minute silence in memory of those that have died as a result of COVID-19. And also to think about those of us, some of us and some of our colleagues have invested so much time, energy and effort into looking after caring and helping the patients and their families who have suffered as a result of this disease. So we'll start that now before I call on our speaker. Thank you very much. Um, we now turn to um, the main reason why most of you are here this evening, which is to listen to one of Britain's most eminent um, scientists and most eminent researchers, and who also makes a huge contribution to public understanding and communication about science and about, um, about mental health disease, which is of course, um, something that has been uh, much neglected, but something which has come to the fore in relationship to COVID-19 and is a great deal on people's minds. Um, Simon really needs absolutely no introduction because he, um, he, he is well known in the Jewish community and in the public domain. And one of the best things about him is that um, anybody you talk to about him says that he's always willing to do things like uh, this public communication uh, to us about the work that he does and to show his enthusiasm as well as his excellence. Um, Simon. Thank you very much, David. Um, so you said that I'm the main reason for this evening, but the, under normal circumstances, it would be the food. And I'm very sorry that you're not having your delicious annual dinner, um, but I'll try my best to be a substitute. Thank you, David, for inviting me to do this. Um, I know you're at UCL and I was there for my PhD and then as a lecturer. So I remember the place fondly. Uh, tonight, I'm talking about the topic of my new book, uh, The Pattern Seekers. And you can see the subtitle, How Autism Drives Human Invention. Um, let's Okay, so um, the book really addresses a big question, which is, is there a link between autism, the neurodevelopmental condition, and invention? And on the face of it, one wouldn't really expect any link at all. You know, autism is a, a disability, 
that affects social relationships and communication. Uh, and many people with autism uh, find it overwhelming when there is unexpected change. Invention, on the other hand, is one of the crowning characteristics of our species. I'll argue uniquely um, Homo sapiens. Um, but I hope to show you during the course of this, um, this uh, talk tonight that there's actually evidence for uh, links between these two, these two phenomena. So what I'm gonna do first is go to the question about what do we mean by invention and take you back in history to what some people argue is the origins of invention. Because if we look at some of our Homo ancestors, like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and the Neanderthals, some people argue that because they used stone tools, they were able to invent. You can see um, Homo habilis lived 2.1 million years ago through to about one and a half million years ago. And their stone axes or hammers were certainly, they had limited functions as tools. You could use them to, like a hammer, to crack a nut. Um, you could use them to cut and to scrape. And you can see that Homo erectus, who lived 2.1 million years ago through to 250,000 years ago, the design of their tools had slightly changed. And we see that, um, again, the design had slightly changed in the case of the Neanderthals, who lived um, from about 200,000 years ago, sorry, 200,000 years ago through to um, 40,000 years ago. But what was interesting about this period of, of human evolution uh, before Homo sapiens, was that actually there was very little invention. Although they were making these simple stone tools, and I'll talk about why I think they're simple relative to the complex tools that Homo sapiens makes, there was very little change in the design of their tools over literally 2 million years. And actually, when we look at other species living today, on our planet, we see tool use, again, simple tool use in many different species. So on the left, we've got a chimpanzee, again, using a rock as a hammer to crack a nut. Um, on the right, uh, we see a crow dropping a stone into water to make the water level rise so that they can access the juicy bait. And I think probably uh, what we were seeing in terms of simple tool use in our ancestors before Homo sapiens and what we see in many living species today can be explained in terms of what's called associative learning, where you simply form an association between two items, A and B. And if B happens to be a reward, like the juicy insides of the nut, then you tend to repeat that pattern of behavior. And that may explain why you get a lot of repetition over 2 million years with our ancestors, but not much sign of what I call generative invention, the ability to invent not once, um, but to invent unstoppably, which is what we see in humans, in modern humans. So my argument is that if we look at the timeline of human uh, evolution and look at the rate of invention for the longest time for about two million years since the earliest stone tools we see almost no invention and then suddenly around 70,000 to 100,000 years ago we see an abrupt change in the rate of invention and I'll show you some examples shortly but I'm going to argue that what changed in the evolution of the human brain was um, a cognitive revolution, a change in how we think, 
the result of two new circuits in the brain. And you can see the rate of invention has become um, exponential. So let's start with the first of these circuits that I think evolved around 70 to 100,000 years ago. And in my book, I call it the systemizing mechanism. So this was a circuit in the brain that allowed Homo sapiens and no species before or since, no other species before or since, to identify very special patterns in the world. I call them if and then patterns. And I borrow this language from the logician, George Boole, who you can see pictured on the left, 19th century logician, uh, who, whose name will be very familiar to many of you, uh, because the logic, the way he analyzed the logic of human thought has also been the foundation of computers, for example. But this mechanism in the brain, the systemizing mechanism, looks for these if and then patterns. If I take one thing and I perform some action on it, so I change it, then I get a particular outcome. It's an algorithm which you'll see, I hope, underlies all of human generative invention. And what the systemizing mechanism does is looks for these patterns, these rules, out in the world. So you look for them, you find them, you then repeat your observations or you repeat your experiments to confirm the pattern. Um, and when you can repeat it and confirm it, you know that it's something true. And then you can start to take it apart. You can start to vary the if, or you can vary the and. These are variables in the system to get a new outcome, a new then. So engineers are very familiar with this way of thinking about systems. I'm using the language if and then, but engineers would call it input, operation, output. Input is whatever comes in. The operation is uh, anything you perform on the input. And the output obviously is then what comes out at the other end. And you can see very importantly, that in any system, uh, there's a feedback loop because once you identify the if and then pattern, you want to go back and repeat it over and over again, just like engineers do. They might repeat it a hundred times, a thousand times, even a million times to make sure that their system works in a precise and accurate way. And then having confirmed that it holds true, you can then start to change the input or change the operation to get a new output. And this is really what gives rise to invention. This is why humans can invent and no other animal can invent. So what makes me argue for the systemizing mechanism having evolved around 70 to 100,000 years ago? Well, if you go to the archeological record, you see the first example, the earliest example of jewelry. This necklace dates back 75,000 years. They're made of shells with little holes that are drilled into each shell. And we can imagine that the inventor, the maker of this necklace was thinking, if I make a hole in each shell and thread a string through each hole, then the shells will form a necklace. So it's the if and then logic that was producing what I call a complex tool, no longer just a hammer to crack a nut, but we're now doing something a bit more complex. At around the same time, 71,000 years ago, is the earliest evidence of the bow and arrow. And again, we see the same algorithm in the human mind at work, in the mind of the inventor. If I attach an arrow to a stretchy fiber and release the tension in the fiber, then the arrow will fly. So suddenly we're doing something a lot more complex than simply the stone ax. This is one of my favorite examples. It's the earliest musical instrument that's ever been found. It was found in a cave in Germany and it's dated to about 40,000 years old. I had the privilege of going to the cave where it was found and the little museum nearby to talk to the professor of archeology span 
who found it. But again, if we put ourselves into the shoes of our Homo sapiens ancestor 40,000 years ago, we can imagine he, was, he or she was thinking, if I blow down this hollow bone, it's a bone from a, a bird, and cover one hole, then I make a particular sound. So this person, imagine in a cave in Germany 40,000 years ago had invented the first musical instrument, but also he or she had invented another system, not just a musical instrument, but a system of notes, because they might have thought, if I blow down this hollow bone and uncover the hole, then I make a different sound. So we suddenly have the production of a, a system which is nothing more than an if and then pattern in the form of music. And we know that in that same period, inventions uh, were unstoppable. We see the first cave paintings. 25,000 years ago, we see these beautiful sculptures at a completely different level to what had come before. 23,000 years ago, the earliest sewing needles. And of course, progress continued, but I'm arguing with the same algorithm in the human brain, the systemizing mechanism. So if we think about um, agriculture, the invention of agriculture some 12,000 years ago, which transformed the way our species lived, both in terms of nutrition and in terms of lifestyle, the same algorithm plays out. If I take a tomato seed and plant it in moist soil, then I get a tomato plant. So, and these are repeatable patterns. And that's, that's the nature of systemizing, that you repeat, and then of course you can start to vary it. You can take two tomato seeds and get two, two tomato plants coming out at the other end, at the output end. I'm quite struck whenever I drive to the West Country and I go past Stonehenge, as many of you probably are too, how on earth did humans some 5,000 years ago move such heavy stones to be able to create this monument? And again, the, um, the likely interpretation is that our, our ancestors were using this kind of logic that if I have a heavy stone, and I harness it to my ox, then the heavy stone will move. So move, transporting heavy objects across long distances to be able to build uh, structures like Stonehenge was possible because of the systemizing mechanism. Um, and here what we're seeing is that what was previously an animal, an ox, is now being understood to itself be a tool in a system. So we no longer see the ox as an ox, but we see the ox as the and variable in the if and then logic. And of course, we can come right up to the present day because invention hasn't stopped. We've just invented vaccines against COVID. COVID. But if we, if we look at what went on in the minds of, for example, the inventors in Oxford of the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's the, if I take the genes for COVID spike protein and I put them into a harmless virus, um, then I have a vaccine against COVID. So it's the harmless virus that's injected into our bodies. Invention is still going on and it's due to this systemizing mechanism in the brain, I argue. But let's go back to that necklace some 75,000 years ago, because the necklace, I think, betrays that we didn't just have a new systemizing mechanism, which allowed us to make the necklace, new systemizing mechanism in the brain, but we also had another, another new circuit, which I call the empathy circuit, because, of course, the motive for making the necklace would have been how could I be perceived by others? When we wear jewellery, we don't just make jewellery for the sake of it. We're wearing it in order to 
send a message to an audience who might be observing us, either that the, the jewellery might make us look more beautiful, or the jewellery might be seen as giving us high status, or we might make the jewellery to give as a gift to somebody else to please them. So the, the existence of the necklace shows us that our ancestors as long ago as 75,000 years ago were able to think about the thoughts and feelings of other people, which is basically empathy. And you could make the same argument for the musical instrument. The systemizing mechanism allowed us to make the instrument, but the maker of the flute wasn't just thinking, what can I make and how can I make it? But also what's the impact going to be on another person? Will the listener enjoy my music? Will the listener um, understand my intention, my message when I play the music? So empathy was also suddenly available in the human mind, the empathy circuit. The empathy circuit allowed for a, a change in, our, in the complexity of our social behavior as humans that we just do not see to the same extent in other species. For example, it allowed us to deceive other people because once you can think about other people's thoughts, you can also make people believe things are true when they're not. It allowed us to reflect on our own minds as well as other people's minds. So it enabled self-reflection or self-awareness. Arguably the empathy circuit enabled teaching because we as a species, can think what, to, what does the other person need to know? And we can impart information, for example, to juvenile members of our own group, our own species, which we just don't see in other species. And a whole host of other things flowed from having empathy, such as referential communication and social cooperation on a large scale. But I want to go back to the main question for tonight. Is there a link between autism and the uniquely human capacity for invention. Well, anecdotally, if we look at famous inventors, we often see in their biographies that they had a lot of autistic traits. This is Thomas Edison. We know him as the inventor of the first electric light bulb, but in fact, he invented hundreds of things. He had hundreds of patents or patents he was also fascinated as a child by Morse code, which is nothing more than a system of if and then rules. But if you look at his behavior as described by his biographers, he, he was experimenting day and night. He had a family, he had children. Uh, he actually called his children Dot and Dash because of his passion for Morse code. His wife moved his mattress into his workshop because it was clear that he would be working all the hours of the day and night and he could just sleep in his workshop and carry on experimenting and invent in inventing. So anecdotally, we see sometimes these high levels of autistic traits in talented inventors. People have argued that these two individuals also showed a lot of autistic traits. On the left, Isaac Newton, a fellow of my college here in Cambridge, Trinity College, Cambridge. On the right, needs no introduction, Albert Einstein. Both of them, if you read biographies of their lives, despite, or maybe, um, you know, alongside their talent as scientists, they, they had unusual difficulties. Einstein didn't talk until he was five years old. Language delay, something that we see in autistic children. And through most of his life, he, wanted, he, he said he preferred to, to be alone rather than with others so that he could devote himself to his work. I, um, uh, Isaac Newton famously got into conflict uh, with many colleagues um, and uh, showed difficulties in his social interactions. Uh, as a, a lecturer in my college, the students found his lectures very difficult to follow and one by one stopped coming to his lectures until there were no more students, but he still continued to give his lectures to an empty lecture theater 
because it was part of his contract with the university. So again, we see peculiar traits in these very talented individuals. And this, some, some of you may recognize, is Glenn Gould, the uh, classical pianist, who again was renowned for his musical ability. We've talked already about music as a system, but needed a lot of predictability in his life. He would go to the same diner every night after concerts and order the same food, eating at the same table at the same time, uh, and needed a lot of other uh, repetition in his personal life, a lot of autistic traits. What about the other way around? If we look at autistic people, do we see a talent in pattern recognition? Well, this is Derek Paravicini, who is autistic. He has learning difficulties, so he has the mental age of a three-year-old. He's also congenitally blind. And yet, if he hears any jazz song just once, he can reproduce it perfectly on a piano. And if you ask him to transpose the jazz song into a different style or a different key, he can do it instantly. So for him, his autism is associated with pattern perception, in this case, auditory patterns. This is Daniel Tammet, who I diagnosed. Some of you may know his books. He's autistic and he also has synesthesia, which is a mixing of the senses. Um, he came to prominence because he memorized the number pi, not just to a few decimal places like you and me, but he memorized pi to 22,400 decimal places. Uh, he performed this you know, as a recital. And for him, numbers are the patterns that he loves. And finally, just as an anecdote, this autistic man is the number one world champion in the Rubik Cube. So although he struggles with social skills and with communication, ever since he first was given a Rubik Cube at the age of 10, he became ranked in the top players in cubing in the world and he's ranked number one in the three by three Rubik cube, which is what you see shown here, but also the four by four, the five by five, the six by six and the seven by seven. So the more, e even more complex cubes than the one shown here, including doing it with one hand. And in your, some of you who know about Rubik cube competitions is that you, it's a timed competition. So this is suggesting that both pe uh, people in the world of invention may have high numbers of autistic traits and people who have a diagnosis of autism may have an aptitude for understanding systems. But anecdotes don't add up to evidence. What we really need is to look at this in a scientific way. We conducted uh, a study called, which we call the UK Brain Types Study, where over half a million non-autistic people took part on an, in an online study. And we gave them um, a measure of autistic traits, which we developed called the Autism Spectrum Quotient. Um, we were very fortunate that also 36,000 autistic people took part in this study too, making it the largest study of autism that's been conducted in the world. Uh, what we found, and this is the first piece of data that I'm showing you, is that if we looked at the general population, this is half a million, 600,000 people, and we looked at them in terms of their occupations and divided them into those that worked in STEM, science, technology, engineering, or maths, or non-STEM, any other kind of job, those working in STEM, shown in red here, had a higher number of autistic traits. So what we're seeing at the level of, in this case, self-report on a metric of autistic traits is a link between people who have an aptitude at invention or at technology or at science and the number of autistic traits you have. What you see is that in all of these groups, there's a bell curve. So autism isn't just an all or none binary thing. 
we all have some autistic traits and it's a matter of degree how many you have. Um, you won't be surprised that the autistic people not shown in this graph, um, their, their distribution was shifted over to the right. They had an even higher number of autistic traits. But what I wanted to show you here was the link between STEM and autistic traits. In that same study, we also gave the, the participants two other questionnaires. One measured empathy and the other measured systemizing. So on the left, what you're seeing is a model of how we can, um, we can score everybody on each of these two measures, empathy, empathy and systemizing. So if you score zero, you're absolutely average in the population. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, as you go upwards, you're above average. And as you go down, you're below average. And on the x-axis, the horizontal, as you go out to the right, you're above average. And as you go out to the left, you're below average. And what we did was look at the difference between people's empathy and their systemizing. So we're taking, we call it a difference score. And this gives rise to five groups in the population, five types of brain. I'm gonna try and use my mouse to indicate, but this, these gray dots here is one type of, of brain type. We call it type E, individuals whose empathy is at a higher level than their systemizing. And then if we look at this light gray, solid light gray group here, they show the reverse profile. Their systemizing is at a higher level than their empathy. Of course, there are people in the white zone in, in between who are equally good at systemizing and empathy. We call them type B for balanced. And then we've got two other groups. The extreme of type E, people who are empathizing nonstop to a very high level. They're always worrying about what other people are thinking and feeling. But the world of patterns and systems is not that interesting to them, and they may even struggle with it. They're below average, as you can see on this axis. And then this extreme group, we call them the extreme of type S, are individuals who systemize nonstop. They're always looking for patterns in the world, patterns in data, and they're very quick and accurate at, at that. But their empathy is at least minus one, so they have a big difference between their systemizing and their empathy. And this is where we find the majority of autistic people fall in the population. In fact, on the right, you can see the data from over half a million people that the yellow, the, the yellow dots are women in the population. The green dots are men in the population. So they're clustering slightly differently. And the purple and uh, pink dots here are autistic men and women clustered down on the bottom right hand quadrant. So this is giving rise to diversity in the population. Um, and I'll come back to the, the concept of neurodiversity, that there are many different types of brain in the population. Uh, but what we're seeing is that autistic people tend to show a brain that is associated with above average levels of systemizing, another clue of a link between autism and aptitude at invention or understanding systems. But could this difference lie in our genes? Could this link lie in our genes? So in a subset of those individuals, we were able to collect DNA by working with the company 23andMe Many of you will have heard of them, the personal genomics company. So we asked people not only to take the questionnaires, but also to provide us with a saliva sample so we could extract DNA and conduct genome-wide association studies, looking at common genetic variants that we all carry, to, but in different combinations, so-called polymorphisms, single nucleotide polymorphisms, to see if there was any association between uh, common genetic polymorphisms in certain combinations and your score in systemizing, 
Um, and then we compared that to genome-wide association studies of autism. And what you can see on the right, we published this just in 2019, was that many of the common genetic variants that are associated with systemizing overlap with those that are associated with a diagnosis of autism. Uh, it was about a 26% overlap. So what this is telling us is that the genes that contribute to autism, we've known that autism is a genetic disability for a long time, it runs in families, but the genes that are associated with, with autism don't just code for autism or for disability, they also code for aptitude in systemizing, which underlies invention. So I think that this is making us rethink autistic people. And if you followed my argument going all the way back 70 to 100,000 years ago, there's no reason to assume that our genetics, our genomes have changed that much in 100,000 years. It means that those people who were driving invention right through modern Homo sapiens history were high in autistic traits. There was one more study which I want to tell you about, which I think again bears out this relationship between autism and invention. And that's what we call the Silicon Valley study, because it's been said anecdotally for quite a while that rates of autism in Silicon Valley are much higher than in the rest of the world. Autism is about 1% of the population but in Silicon Valley, anecdotally, they say it's much higher. Well, we, Silicon Valley is a long way away from where I am now. So we went to study this phenomenon in a Silicon Valley closer to home in the Netherlands. We went to the city of Eindhoven, which some of you will have heard of. Eindhoven is, um, it, it's known for IT, and for STEM, because it has the Institute of Technology there. And Eindhoven has also had the Philips factory there for over a hundred years, attracting people who are good at IT, good at technology to move there, have families and raise their children. So what we did was we compared the rates of autism in Eindhoven to two other Dutch cities, Utrecht and Haarlem, that were matched for demographics and other relevant variables. And what, what you can see here is we found that the rates of autism in Eindhoven were more than twice as high as in the two other Dutch cities. Again, suggesting that where you find high concentrations of parents who are good at science, good at uh, technology, engineering and maths, you also see higher rates of autism amongst their children consistent with the genetic study that I, I, I described earlier. So I want to kind of finish with, you know, what does this tell us? And, you know, what's the message for us today as a society? What we've seen, I hope I've tried to show you, is that autistic people may have played a central role in driving human progress, in having uh, higher aptitude for understanding systems, understanding patterns, which lies at the heart of invention. And yet, if we look at autistic people today, and this goes back to David's point about mental health, we find the majority of autistic adults have very poor mental health. The majority of them have depression and anxiety. We conducted a survey amongst the hundreds of patients who come to our clinic here in Cambridge and ask them about whether they'd ever felt suicidal and whether they'd ever attempted suicide. And we discovered some shocking statistics that two thirds of them had felt suicidal and one third of them had attempted suicide. And we published this in the Lancet Psychiatry in 2015 as a wake up call to the government that if we don't intervene to provide more support for autistic people, then we are going to see continuing high levels of poor mental health and suicidality.
So what are we doing as a society to autistic people? And is this the way we repay these individuals who may have made such a central contribution to human progress? Three quarters of autistic adults are unemployed. And we know that unemployment by itself is a risk factor for poor mental health. Unemployment makes you feel that you're not valued by society, that you're excluded from society. It takes away your autonomy because you don't have a wage so that you can't make individual choices. So there's a, a strong need for us all to start thinking about how we can change society wherever we work to bring in autistic people into the workplace. And the question is, what kind of change can be made? And I'm going to finish with this example from the Israeli army, the IDF, that has a special unit called Unit 9900, which allows autistic people to serve as soldiers. And what they do is they ask these autistic people in this unit to look at aerial photographs to spot any, any patterns that might be a sign of suspicious terrorist activity. And as I said, autistic people, they're very quick at spotting change in patterns. They're very quick at spotting anything unusual. And they can stay on task for long periods because they have a narrow focus of attention. And this is just one example of an employer, it happens to be a military uh, employer, making sure that autistic people can play their part in society to help the common good. I'm going to end with this word neurodiversity that I mentioned earlier. Many of you will have heard of this term, that neurodiversity is essentially saying that brains don't come in just one type. All of our brains are different. We saw earlier that you can you can um, carve up any population into at least five brain types based on the difference between a person's level of empathy and their level of systemizing. And that autistic people have one particular kind of brain type, a passion for patterns, but they struggle with some aspects of empathy, reading people and navigating the social world. But this quote comes from an autistic person in the States, Temple Grandin. Um, and she says, I'm different, but I'm not less. That we shouldn't regard people who are different, including those with disabilities, as inferior or as broken, because they simply process information. They process the world in different ways, and they can make their contributions equally. Thank you very much. Professor Baron Cohen, thank you very, very much. Um, before we um, move to thank you, are you happy to take some questions? Because I can see there are some questions coming up in the chat. I can happily, just to save you, because they've come up in lots of different places, the uh, the ones that have come up already, I can, I can um, sort through and, and put to you on behalf of the people who've typed them in if you want and more people could type in as we go would that be okay with you of course so so if you if you select the question yep, I'll, I'll select a few so sure. I've got a combined question they didn't realize it was being combined but they're both on the same theme from Simon Nadel and Mervyn Jaswan one is a comment one is a question as they say at all the best conferences um, that relates to inventiveness not being just in STEM sub subjects, it also happens in the arts. So is the gene uh, overrepresented in autistic traits more common in musicians as systematizers, or in fact, are musicians creatives rather than systematizers? That yeah. would be Irvin Jazz one bit of that question. Okay, um, shall I have a go at that one first? Yeah. Uh, so yes, I mean, we, we had the opportunity to look at the genetics of systemizing, which was a questionnaire about how easily, you've, how easily you can uh, understand how systems work. And the questionnaire covers a whole range of different types of systems, mechanical systems, 
abstract systems like maths or algebra uh, or I don't know um, uh, syntax, uh, natural systems like the weather, uh, but it was also domestic systems like cooking. Um, and we found this genetic association. We found that systemizing is partly genetic and that it overlaps with autism. But this question is absolutely right that, you know, we, that many of what we call the arts also involve systems. We saw that with music. We, I gave you examples of sculpture and cave painting. Um, dance is often highly systematic. We haven't yet had an opportunity to look at the genetics of these more artistic ways of understanding systems. But, uh, you know, a next project, which we hope to get funded, would be looking at the genetics of musical ability and to see whether that too overlaps, as we would predict, with the genetics of autism. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. So uh, related and unrelated, there was another occupational question, um, which was um, from uh, David Howell, which was um, really to do with autism in politics, I think, and how you think this interfaces with Dominic Cummings' invitation for misfits to work in government. Do you think he's inviting uh, a, a scheme like the scheme you described in Israel that uh, is actually genuinely looking for, for skills? Or do you think this is something maybe a bit different? Uh, yes, I, you know, I wouldn't agree with Dominic Cummings in terms of the choice of his language. I wouldn't, I, you know, I think the, the word misfits is slightly derogatory, shall we say. Um, so I prefer, I prefer the idea of neurodiversity, that people who think differently and it's not just in government. I think any organization should try to include people who think differently, people who think out of the box. Autistic people, just as one example of neurodiverse individuals, they don't tend to follow the crowd. They tend to question things and think about whether the system, the organization could do things differently. So they go, they like to go back to first principles. You know, and this is often called disruptive innovation. You kind of disrupt the way we've always done things and start trying to think about whether we can do things differently. And that should be true in, in government. It should be true uh, in medicine. It should be true in, in any walk of life, really, that we need individuals who question and think about whether we can do things better. So I wonder whether that links a bit to, um, I'm not taking these questions in order, but Sylvia Lacquer has, has put in the chat, perhaps in relation to that, invention is associated with openness, I believe, which relates to what you just said, but then she asks, are autistic people very open to new ideas and experiences? Right. Um, so I think I've tried to argue that invention, um, as a first step, you have to identify the patterns. And then you have to repeat them. So that's not really openness. It's, it leads to a lot of repetition. And when people look at autistic children or adults, they often say they're very repetitive. You know, they like to collect the same thing over and over again, like stamp collecting, you know, but they're looking for patterns and repetition is a very important part of it. But once you've kind of seen the patterns, then there's scope for starting to play with them, to experiment with the patterns. And it's so it's not, I mean, openness is a bit of a vague term, but I think that, you know, invention, first of all, requires really understanding your system in depth. And that takes, it takes time, it takes effort, and it takes uh, repetition. And then you can start to experiment. So if you try to understand your computer, for example, you might want to go through all the functions of your computer and repeat them over and over again. So you really understand it. But then you might want to take the computer apart and start seeing what happens if I change one component. Could I expand the memory? Could I expand the processing power so that you have a better computer? And it's that sense of being open to new ideas, definitely, but only after you've really understood the existing pattern. And, and thank you. you. You might have predicted that some variant of this question would come up. Two people have raised it from different areas. Uh, and I would have predicted it because I first um, uh, 
became aware of your work when I was doing my undergraduate degree at Cambridge when we were thinking about gender differences in development and, and the roles of um, uh, fetal exposure to, I'm an endocrinologist, so fetal exposure to hormones. So right. there is a question here from Andrew Sauchenko with respect to genetics about whether genetic inheritance and autism traits uh, it follows the father or the mother more. And the rather um, uh, less academic, I wonder whether he's coming from a personal perspective here, John Goldin wants to know, are all men a bit autistic? Right, okay. So let's take the first question, which is about the sort of uh, the inherit the, the mode of inheritance in the in the genetics of autism. Um, it's not it's not simple. The genetics it's 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 complex. It's it's polygenic. Uh, some forms of autism are syndromic, and they involve rare mutations. But most forms of autism don't have those rare mutations. Uh, most forms of autism, although they they show heritability are involving common genetic variants, but hundreds, if not thousands of gene of, 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 of polymorphisms, and they could be coming from both sides of the family. So that kind of answers that first question, I think. Just sort of picking up on your point about prenatal hormones, uh, it was our group in Cambridge that uh, first demonstrated that uh, if you look at the pregnancies, that result in an autistic child, there are higher levels of prenatal androgens and estrogens in those pregnancies measured in the amniotic fluid that surrounds the fetus. And we know that these androgens and estrogens masculinize brain development, both in other animals and in humans too. Um, so this kind of links to this second, it sounds slightly frivolous question, um, about, you know, are all men a bit autistic? Certainly what we've found is that if you look at gender in that big population study, the 600,000, on average, men do show more autistic traits than women. It doesn't mean that they're a bit autistic. They just have more autistic traits. Um, we know that those prenatal hormones, uh, particularly the androgens, are at a higher level in the male fetus than in the female fetus. And that this may go some way to explaining why autism is diagnosed more commonly in boys than in girls. So we're kind of looking at a, a genetic factor. There is definitely a genetic predisposition, maybe in combination with an environmental factor, in this case, the uterine environmental factor, which is hormone exposure, uh, which interact to contribute to the likelihood of autism. And the hormones, as I've touched on, are not the only environmental factor. Increasingly, we're understanding other ones. So for example, women uh, who have gestational diabetes uh, also have a much higher likelihood of having an autistic child. And we know that gestational diabetes, again, doesn't just disrupt insulin, but also has an impact on the sex steroid hormones. So there is a hormonal factor in there, which may be sex linked. Could I, there's a whole bunch of questions here. I'm going to have to, could I just, while I'm having a look through them, could I just up, have a follow-up question, if I may, about the gender difference that you've described? Because there's a, there's a sort of counter discussion around the way that we assess for the traits, isn't there? Um, and whether it, uh, it, the gender difference is less pronounced than we might think because women express the traits differently and maybe answer the questionnaires differently, not mm. because they're differently, uh, they're, not because they have different kinds of neurodiversity, just because they express it differently. And yeah. I'd be really interested in your view on that. Right. Um, I think this is a really important point because Autism was first described in the 1940s, uh, actually by a Jewish um, pediatrician um, and child psychiatrist, um, Leo Kanner, who kind of fled Nazi Europe to go to work in the States in John Hopkins University in um, Baltimore. Uh, but we've known about autism since the 1940s, since his classic paper. Um, 
and the sex ratio has been about four males to one female. But what we're seeing in recent years is more girls and more women getting diagnosed so that the sex ratio is attenuating. Uh, it's now about three males to one female uh, and in some studies even two males to one female. So the gap is closing if you like. There's still a male bias and some people wonder whether we've been missing autistic females either because as clinicians we're just less experienced at recognizing what autism looks like in females, in little girls, uh, or in women, or because females may feel greater pressure, social pressure, to hide their autism. Um, there's a, a group in UCL, actually, uh, who call this camouflaging, where women may be just as autistic, and girls may be just as autistic, but they feel social expectations to be able to chat and communicate and have friends so they do their utmost to hide their autism but at some personal cost because it causes a lot of stress they can't just be who they are so this is these you know these these are important there's a new area of, of trying to understand how is autism um how does it how does it manifest differently between different genders we've just um uh been awarded a grant from a, a big foundation in the states to study sex differences in autism that after you know 70 years of knowing about autism we're only just beginning to address this question of does autism manifest differently in males and females thank you and, and links actually to a question in the q a from nicola marx which isn't about gender but which is about uh, whether there are cultural determinants and therefore whether it's different in different cultures which might accept different kinds of variants of behaviours as normal or not normal uh, and how maybe that impacts on, on whether a diagnosis would be made or, or whether someone would just be a bit quirky. Absolutely. Um, I prefer quirky to misfit, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm sure that culture plays a part. Um, you know, most of the research in autism, just like in many conditions, is biased towards studies in North America, in the UK, um, to some extent in, you know, in Sweden, you know, but we don't really know what does autism look like in some of the African countries, for example, or in India, or in, or in very different non-Western cultures. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we have to, we, we need more research into kind of cross-cultural differences. Uh, but you're, I think you're making another point too, which is that if a culture is very accepting of difference, it may be that the person doesn't seek a diagnosis, that the culture kind of accepts them for who they are, maybe even values them for being different. And we see this a lot in, um, you know, even if, if you go into some niches even within our culture if you go into the maths department in cambridge people will openly say well i feel quite autistic but they haven't gone to get a diagnosis because they're valued by their colleagues by their community for being good at what they do which is spotting patterns in numbers and uh you know uh, maybe even coming up with solving particular problems uh equations as systems if you like so if there's a culture of acceptance, uh, the person is no, no longer feels disabled, no longer experiences the poor mental health, perhaps. Uh, and in that sense, they may not need a diagnosis. Great. I'm, I'm conscious that um, time is moving on. There's a couple of very specific questions, and then I, I think we'll let you continue with your evening as and, and everyone else. Uh, one question is about whether people with learning difficulties can be diagnosed as autistic and the other is given that autism is a, a constellation of traits for your hypothesis that relates to inventiveness or invention are there particular traits that invention tracks with or is it the whole picture that it tracks with? Yeah that, no, those are two really good questions. Um, Perhaps I should have said right at the outset that autism co-occurs with many conditions and that includes learning difficulties. When I started out in this field 
which was back in the 1980s, uh, the majority of autistic people who were getting diagnosed also had learning difficulties. Something like three quarters of autistic people also had an IQ below the average range. Today, the profile of the autism community is the reverse, that three quarters of autistic people do not have learning difficulties. So they've got an IQ in the average or above average range, but it's still there, it's a significant association. Um, and your, the second question, um, which is about whether invention or you know this capacity for systemizing, does it sort of track with particular symptoms or characteristics in autism? Well, I would say that diagno the diagnostic features of autism that go, that go very closely with systemizing are repetitive behavior. It's one of the first things that a psychiatrist or pediatrician or clinical psychologist will be looking for. Is the child or adult being unusually repetitive in their behavior? Um, and that's often seen as pathological, but actually I argue in my book that it's a sign of their learning style because they're looking for systems and they love to repeat. You know, you think about an autistic child who likes to watch the washing machine going round and round in its cycle, but actually they're probably paying really close attention to whether the cycle is identical every time, the pattern. Uh, it probably also tracks with another symptom, which is so-called obsessions, that autistic people love to go into one topic in great depth. Again, you can think of aut an autistic child who gets so immersed in the world of dinosaurs, that's the only thing they want to read about or talk about. Sometimes, you know, it's boring for everybody else because that child just wants to know everything about dinosaurs, all the names of the different species, what they ate, where they lived, why they died, when they died, etc. facts and, and detail. But actually that is understanding a system in enormous detail. And that we should let autistic people be as repetitive as they like and be as obsessional as they like, because this is their learning style of how to understand a system in exquisite detail. Fascinating. So um, I guess it's uh, I can see that you've we have pretty much put all of the audience questions to you now. So um, it really uh, is left to me to um, give you a huge vote of thanks, really, for um, spending some time with us. You're, you alluded to the fact that this is the Jewish Medical Association's virtual dinner. And I was uh, put in mind of the fact that whenever uh, I used to be looking for in the days when we were allowed to go to events and dinners and simchas and the rest of it, when I, when I was in my 20s, the thing that I would most look forward to at an event would be the dancing. When I was in my 30s, the thing I'd be most interested in was what the food was going to be. When I was in my 40s, I'd started to think about maybe what the wine would be. Uh, and beyond the 40s, uh, the thing I most look forward to is the speeches. So it's been an enormous treat uh, for me this evening, and I'm sure for everybody else, uh, not just to look forward to the speech. And frankly, the speech was all there was to look forward to, and it was absolutely terrific. Um, but what a treat to be able to hear about um, this area of research, but also this whole program of bringing together detailed research together with um, a huge commitment to explaining that research, both to other clinicians and also to the wider public. And I'm sure many people in the audience know that that's linked with a significant amount of constructive and proactive work with members of the autism and uh, uh, community, uh, not just in terms of clinical help, but also things like working with organizations that proactively provide appropriate employment. And in an era in 2021, we're all about celebrating diversity and difference, and that's all good. It sometimes makes it difficult and politically charged to be able to investigate and research that diversity and difference rather than just say it is what it is. Um, and it's fascinating that you have been able to do so and continue to do so. 
and uh, I'm sure I speak for everybody when I, I say that we've loved hearing about it. And um, we should also take this opportunity to do two things. One is uh, it went by the wayside in the flyer for the dinner, but we should wish you a hearty mazel tov for not just being a professor Baron Cohen, but as of this year also Sir, Professor Sir, if that is the correct order, uh, which is a, of course, a huge honor um, to you and uh, a reflected glory for uh, the community as well as those who work with you. And we should also take this opportunity to wish you and everybody a Chag uh, Sameach and a happy and peaceful kosher and COVID free Yom Tov. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been really great. Thank you. Chag Sameach to all of you. And there you can see if you hang on and have a look at the chat, you can see there are various uh, thanks. Uh, Fiona has, Sim has just put, uh, it beats any dinner. So that's it, even, even rice catering, there we are. <laughs> well, it beat this dinner anyway, but the competition wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. David, do you want to say anything to the uh, attendees before they go? Your microphone's off. Your microphone's off, but they can see you're speaking. Microphone off. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Marilyn, too. And um, I, the comments speak for themselves. Thank you. <laughs>